So let's go. Let's go ahead and read Memorial, and then we'll kind of talk about wrapping up this uh, this seasonal story arc. Ten Memorial. The air upon the wall was thin. Lakshmi was right about that. Mithrax stood in silent observation of the memorial above the main concourse. He leaned against an iron railing, watching guardians and citizens alike moving below, Elixni with them. The dreg approached the memorial and led his child to stand among the mourners. Urged forward by a gentle nudge, the child gin- gingerly placed a gilded eggshell at the memorial's base. Gold so- so- soldering sealed a myriad of fractures, making a once broken egg whole again. Mithrax's throat tightened at the sight. It was a memorial for a child. Lost. The walkway behind Mithrax groaned as Saint-14 cut a large silhouette against the clear sky. Shoulder to shoulder they stood, and neither spoke. They watched as Ikora and Zavala conversed with departing mourners. The dragon his son approached, and with a bittersweet smile, Ikora made certain to introduce them to Zavala. Big, stern, stoic Zavala took to one knee and spoke to the child eye to eye. I never thought I'd see the day, Saint finally said, unable to look away. Mithrax responded not with words, but with fluttering, purr-like rumble and mirrored Saint's posture. Do you think this will hold? An alliance, fragile like glass, held in a fist, Saint asked. Only the great machine knows what will come from over the horizon. We must be content with our own limited perspectives, Mithrax said with conviction. Saint nodded. Down below, Amanda Holiday drew their attention as she knelt below the mem- before the memorial to light a candle. She stood and stepped back, lingering. Mithrax and Saint watched in silence as she rose up on her toes and began scanning through the crowd, as if she were looking for someone. She gently pushed through the throng of people and reached out to another mourner in a white cloak. Both recoiled in surprise, Amanda seemingly apologizing to the cloaked woman at some misunderstanding. They exchanged brief words, awkward laughs, sympathies. When Amanda caught sight of Sat Lord Saladin, however, she took her leave and disappeared into the crowd. Mourners parted around the Iron Lord, respectful of his space and reputation, as he laid a handful of spent shell casings at the memorial with reverence. The offering's meaning was lost on Mithrax. When Saint rose from the memorial, he turned and looked up at the pair on the overwatch, his face cast in shades of doubt, remorse, and uncertainty as he quietly departed. I do not know that one, Mithrax said with a look to Saint. He seems unhappy. Saint slowly took, shook his head. Lord Saladin, he clarified. He has lost many, lost his heart, his hope. Lost so many, he believes he stands alone, even when surrounded by others. I understand his pain. I see, Saint thinks on how Osiris would describe it. It's a cautionary tale. Mithrax heard the ache in Saint's voice. And how are you? Saint tensed at the question. The railing in his hand creaked as his grip tightened and bent the metal. I am fine, he lied. Indeed, Mithrax said with his best affection of sarcasm, and then placed a hand on Saint's shoulder. It is not above a warrior's station to feel pain, not above a warrior's station to express spirit wounds. Mithrax's grip firmed on Saint's shoulder, reassuring, stabilizing. Not above a warrior's station to break. Saint nodded in half-hearted agreement. I should go, he said in a tone to Mithrax. Did quite, didn't, didn't quite understand. Thank you, Kel of Kells. You are a true friend. Go well, Saint, Mithrax said with concern. Find your lost phoenix. Um, so let's, let's start with Amanda, I guess. I think that's the first thing that kind of jumps out to me here. She's looking for somebody in a cloak, and she goes towards him, somebody in a white cloak. It's pretty clear she's looking for Crow. Yeah. Um... So I think that's that's the mystery. Where's Crow? Where's Osiris? Obviously, mm-hmm. Fosiris. We're gonna call him Fosiris. That's not Osiris. Fosiris. I think that kind of sets up for Amanda and Saint to probably be the primary NPCs for next season with you. Yeah, it's there's almost no way Mithrax isn't as well. Yeah, I. Uh... So why why would she be looking for Crow? Did I miss something? Did I? Did she I just a lot. Her? She worked a lot with Crow in the season of The Chosen. They have banter back and forth. Right. Okay. Yeah. But he was always masked. Right. So, um, and I think that 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 a whole new ripple is added to that because I mean she she's clearly still just devastated by Kate's death. Yeah. Um, she's one of the ones in the tower that it clear. I mean, it clearly weighs on Zavala, but yeah. on her it seems to weigh more than any of the other NPCs, any of the other characters. Yeah. Um, the storytelling they're doing with 
Saladin, though, that they did in Chosen and that they did this season, even though it's quietly been off screen this season, has still, I think, been very powerful. He's unsure of what to think of after we negotiated a truce with Keitel. We have a ceasefire temporarily, and you know now we're welcoming the Elixni into our city, and he's watched so many of his friends die to both. You know, what? how can you be friends with them is what he's thinking, but I think he's also learning how to show mercy for the first time and show restraint. Mm-hmm. Not something Saladin has ever really had to do. I think it's setting up for him to have a major story beat going forward, and if we talk about, you know, we talked about are they going to write out some of these characters we've had around since the beginning, I think Saladin's a logical choice. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as I like Saladin, I think that opens the door for Ephrodite to come back. Yeah. Um, and I could see him, maybe not like in Witch Queen, but like in Lightfall, I could have see him having like a giant moment of self sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And uh, people are going, oh, well, what it's about like, Iron Banner? Like that well, moment where he realizes he's not standing alone and he realizes that he needs to save yeah. the people that are behind him and stand with him, right? Like I could totally see that. There's, you know, the uh, I read, I read a lot. I read some manga and I watch some anime and I, I watch a lot of My Hero Academia. Mm-hmm. There's a character in there that I kind of want to draw a comparison to Lord Saladin and how I feel like his storyline is going. There's a character in there, uh, Kirishima, who he has a power to harden. He can harden his skin into like harder than stone, and he hits a new level in a uh, in an arc against the Yakuza where. Uh, he has a new form. His hero name is Red Riot, and he has a form, Red Riot Unbreakable. He can only hold it for 35 to 40 seconds, but for that period of time, he is literally unmovable, unbreakable. Like He is so hard that when he goes to move, he can hear his skin and his bones creaking. But his thing is, he calls himself that, and he says he's unbreakable because nobody behind me is going to bleed. If I can keep all their attention on me, and he does it time and time again. And these, you know, we, you keep thinking he's going to die doing this. You know, he's become one of the most important supporting characters in that show and in that manga. In that way, I feel like Saladin is kind of that way. That Saladin is going to eventually get to a point where it, maybe it's him and Ephrodite together, the final two Iron Lords, holding the line. And, you know, basically saying, you know, in Rise of Iron, he tells us, you're the first of the new. You know, and then really picked up on that plot point again and i think we're overdue to visit that but you do that maybe you combine that with an iron banner rework like Shax continues to run the iron banner in memory of his friend um i think there's a lot coming for salad in in the coming seasons and in the coming years but that it's ultimately if there's one character that's going to sacrifice himself it's going to be saladin it's going to be one of the titans it's either saladin or zavala it's one of the two I think I think Sal I think it's going to be Saladin just because I still think Zavala is still too important right now. I, I think he's too big. I th- in ter- I think he's too big of a name. I, I think that you you kill off Lance Reddick, you're killing off the guy who not only acts in your game but plays it pretty regularly too. I think you're really like you're risking some stuff there. I feel and like with Crow, like Crow's not here because I think Crow's in the Dreaming City right now. I think he's about to encounter Mara. Yeah, I think so too. I think we're gonna. I think Mara is back in this season because this is it. Like this season fifteen is that unless they magically announce, hey, we're doing a season sixteen too because six months is way too long to go without new content. Uh, which I'll both be happy and I'll be pissed about. <laughs> I don't want another season of content right now. Um, I think you 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 would be able to bring that and then like maybe have Mithrax, you know. Uh, Maybe brokering the peace, you know, between, you know, Mara, Crow, Petra, the city, like all these factions are going to be at each other's throat. And then, I mean, future Warhold is still out there, like future Warhold, Dead Orbit, New Monarchy have all left the city. Like they are still out there. We don't know quite maybe what's going to happen. New, there. Maybe there'll be a new leader that we have to face or something, you know. I mean, it's pretty clear the Dead Orbit leader is in charge because the leader of New Monarchy, I believe, is in custody. Or he's dead, one of the two. He's either in custody or he's dead. Dead Orbit has taken the remainder of those factions that wish to leave. Um, and the rest, it's presumed to have gone into hiding. Akura uh, makes it clear, like, not all of them were complicit in this plot. But Dead Orbit was already planning to leave. They refused to be a part of the coup. They were. They made it clear, we're leaving soon. Yeah. I, I, I still hold to the theory that I think Dead Orbit comes back at some point to help evacuate the city, like they did during the Red War. Um 
that's their whole purpose is mm-hmm. to be able to continue candidate and stars. I mean, maybe we don't see the factions again. Maybe we see them at the beginning of whatever the next destiny is after the end of light and dark. Maybe they finally have done what they, what the Exodus mission said to do and they've colonized uh, an outpost somewhere, you know, and we, we see good, we see the good old, uh, my chemical romance esque leader of dead orbit again. Mm. You know, I, I think there, there's plenty of possibilities here. I think this opens up a lot of those. Um, I think it's important to see that, you know, Zavala and Ikora are mourning, too. Like, this is this is an Elixney memorial. This is, you know, this isn't necessarily for, you know, just humans. And I do think that this is something that they're going to put in the tower. I do think you're going to have a permanent addition to the tower, similar to the hole that is in the tower from the impact of the Almighty. Yeah. I think you're going to have something um, either where the Guardian Game statue is or where the Solstice of Heroes statue normally goes. Yeah. I think there's going to be a permanent addition to the tower somewhere. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, if it's an evolving world, like, you kind of have to do that, right? Yeah, of course. So, uh, I, I like this, though. I think it's a really somber ending. Um, next week, hopefully, I'll be able to do the final piece of lore from this season for the uh, exotic ship that I thought was going live this week. But um, apparently, there may be one final mission next week. Ooh. I may be a simple. Is just going and interact. I, I personally think it's going to be us seeing this memorial on the tower and just going up and interacting with it for a free ship. Mm-hmm. Um, similar to how we got the the emblem for the thing that we did with the uh, Almighty Wreckage mm-hmm. for being part of that. Yeah, and for the live event uh, when the darkness, you know, sunset everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everything's given away during those, and they, they've been, they've made end of season and event events a thing, and I really like that. I hope they continue that. Yeah, trend. Um, I don't know. We'll we'll see. I think the time is also, I and mean, this is kind of related to that. You know, we're out of lower corner. Kind of final thoughts on this week, I guess. Uh, when I look at something like the epilogue, I saw a lot of people saying it felt half baked, and I think it feels half baked because we are now legitimately at a point where I think the old consoles are now holding us back. I think we're at a point where Xbox One and PS4, especially the base models, are holding us all back. Um. We are approaching a time like Destiny 1 did after the Taken King where they said, okay, we have to ditch the old consoles. I think they would have to give more than a sufficient warning and hope to God that more consoles are in stock. Um, But I think we've now reached a point where the base hardware of last generation can no longer support this game. Um, It is nearly unplayable. It, It goes very slow. 60 frames is just such a game changer like you you can't you can't ignore that yeah i mean the the xbox one base version runs at sub 30 right like it's just uh, yeah, it, it's gross it's real bad yeah like if you have a one x you're probably doing okay um you can at least play but it's noticeable when i'm playing with people who are on the older consoles at this point um, I just think at some point you're going to have to leave them behind. I mean, maybe maybe this is one of the first games that uses the thing that Microsoft talked about, which is being able to play games with cloud enabled, and that's going to let them let you play older games on Xbox One. But that still doesn't solve the PS4 problem. I mean, I think uh, I think I think Destiny would be the perfect thing to test it with because most of it is server yeah. side anyway, right? So right. Uh, a lot of it is, I mean, you have the locally downloaded files, but yeah, you, you still have stuff running there. And I mean, you have to have, a, you have to have stable internet connection and all that, but we we're now at the point where we have to at least start having the conversation about moving on from the leg, the now legacy consoles. I think if you hadn't had COVID and you hadn't had the, obviously the impact on availability, I think Bungie would have probably already moved on this. And would have announced it for the Witch Queen. Um, I was surprised. I mean, I said it a couple times. I was very surprised they didn't know it. La- they didn't do it last year. Uh, but I don't think they wanted to pigeonhole like, oh, you have to get this new console if you want to keep playing Destiny. I think with Witch Queen being delayed to first quarter 2022, that gives you another holiday season to get through. There's already 10 million PS5s and almost 7 million Series Xs and Ss out there. I think by and not to mention cloud gaming for Xbox as well. You know, you're going to get to a point after Christmas where if they don't outright tell us in two weeks, I mean, then they very well could be like, hey, we're giving you like six, seven months warning. Try and get one of these consoles because we plan on moving. We plan on moving on. We got to 
We've got to leave something behind at some point. We don't want to wait until light fall to do it. We don't want to have a whole another year and a half after this conversation of us supporting these older consoles. It's just getting harder and harder. So we will definitely see what happens. Yeah, what was it? What was it for for Taken King to Rise of Iron? What did they? What was what was the time they gave us there? Like six months? Uh, three months. They told us in June, and it happened in September. 